And now for the Moneratopia Price Report. What's going on, man? I'm uh, just uh, enjoying a lovely Saturday morning. The weather here is fantastic. We finally, it, it's hot here from like eh, April to June, but then the rain comes in June and uh, it just cools everything down. Like yesterday, the high was maybe like 80 degrees. Where, where, uh, how precisely can you tell us where this is? Central Mexico, up in the mountains. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I say up in the mountains. We're not like on the side of a, you know, on a mountainside. It's like there's man, super remote out there in Mexico. (laughs) You Uh, love it. Yeah, they uh, here like you you basically you go up the mountain chain and then it's kind of like this big plateau and then it's really like basically hilly terrain for like most of central Mexico. And the way the pattern, like the weather pattern, works here for I mean between basically Mexico City almost to Puerto Vallarta. Um, cause the mountains come down obviously when you hit Puerto Vallarta, but, um, yeah, from Mexico city to, um, west of Guadalajara it's, and then north up to, um, like Queretaro and, and other places, it's just, the weather gets beautiful, man. Like everyone else is just dying in the heat up in the North. I hear all the, all the, all the weather reports, you know, they're like, Oh my God, it's the hottest month of whatever. It, it's always the hottest month of whatever, like every single summer. Um, uh, but here it's beautiful. Sounds like a beautiful life, man. Are, are you coming to Monerotopia? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. All right, sweet, sweet, sweet. Yeah, we. How do we? How do we grow Monerotopia in Mexico? How do we get a bunch of people from Mexico? I mean, Mexico City's got what, like thirteen million people, or like I don't even know at this point, fifteen million people. How many? How many people are live in Mexico City? How do we get point zero 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 zero? You know, some small percentage of them. Uh, that would be interested in, you know, being early adopters to digital cash. Come check out Monerotopia. We get, we get, we got to start thinking along those lines. I imagine know? it's a lot cheaper to put up billboards in Mexico, and it would mm, be here. I like, like that. Like advertising man. space. I, like I don't know. It might yeah. be still a ra- lot. Ra- 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 city, radio but... commercials, right? Like, how much mm. could radio commercials in Mexico City be? I mean, it might not be that crazy, right? I don't know. I would think maybe mostly the boomers only listen to the radio. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So even just social media, social media ads, right. Get on, like, put like, start putting ads on Instagram and stuff. I don't know. What do you guys think? What, what, well, I mean, even for radio, here. I think most of, most of the Ubers I've ever been in, they're usually playing some radio station, right? Yeah. That's what I'm that's thinking like too, right? Audience, yeah. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah, because Monerotopia is super open to the public, right? So we ask people buy buy tickets, especially if you're coming in, uh, you can afford it. Please buy at least a general admission ticket. Um, but anybody that wants to show up, we make it very open to the public. The marketplace is open. The 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 uh, Huerta Roma, where we do it, is basically a public park. So it's open for people to come in and walk in. And then we ask that you have a ticket to enter the talks, to enter the dome. But if you're local, we would charge you a nominal amount if you want to go listen to the talks. And just the fact that they'd be in there, in the arena, in the marketplace, they'd be starting to learn about Monero. People would be out there talking about Monero. We'll have um tv set up out there so you could watch the talks outside right so it's very accessible to the public i think we just need to get the word out to them and make them know that it's uh it's an event that they can stop by at right it's like it's just like a thing to do on a saturday let me go check out freaking monerotopia um, did you check out so, the yeah. bitcoin bar last time which which there's a bitcoin bar like i can't remember exactly where yes it, yeah 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 we, we did it we did a meetup there in anticipation, but it wasn't, we didn't get that many people to come to the meetup. It was like, I think like actually Sunita ran the meetup. She ended up somehow ended up in Mexico city without me. We, I forget what the issue was. I wasn't able to go down and she ran a meetup at the Bitcoin bar. Uh, but yeah, we could do that again. We could definitely do that again. Uh, maybe there's like universities we can work with. Who would be like, what would be some good groups to reach out to that would have um, overlapping Mexico city, interests? I, I don't really know. In um, and some of the other cities, like, I mean, pretty much all the major cities have a Bitcoin meetup. There's one here in my city. I could probably go there and show Monero. There's a lot of maximalists. So <laughs> maybe. Uh, right. So maybe we go, we don't, but... we don't try to go after those people, you know, like forget the, the Bitcoiners, right. Forget the maxis. But let's just go after normal people. Right. That, no, but like, that... like at these meetups, the complaint that I've heard from maxis is too many shitcoiners show up to their meetings, which means that there's people 
that would be interested to hear about Monerotopia. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay, I got you. And I'm also okay. known as not, you know, being a maximalist. So they would still have me. <laughs> so I, I'd have to like shill covertly, hand out little flyers. You know, I'd be like the drug dealer of the of the maxi meetup, effectively. Which is would ironically you be, would appropriate. Would you be down to do that? To, to, to do a meetup in Mexico City? Is that something you'd want to do? We could help you. Uh... I mean, I'm not anywhere close to Mexico City. You know, oh, okay. It'd be like right. it'd be like saying, "Oh, well, um, I'm in Miami, but let me head over to Atlanta to uh, maybe it's not." Quite okay. Right, 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 right. Oh yeah, maybe maybe we could find somebody else to do that. Uh, but yeah, I'll let you continue with your price report. But guys, yeah, definitely grab your tickets. It gives us more momentum, and just more importantly, spread the word on Monerotopia. If you have ideas for how we could spread it in Mexico, please let me know. And anything else you want to let me know, any other way you want to participate in Monerotopia, we're extremely open-minded to letting people participate and figuring out how you can do it, make it work for you, um, you know, without giving us money necessarily. We're, we're very open. If you have some project you want to come present and we think it's cool and it's worthy, you know, you come for free, set up a stand, whatever. Um, it, you could email us, Monerotopia at ProtonMail.com. And if you want to be a sponsor, obviously, reach out, all that stuff. But Monerotopia at ProtonMail.com. Reach out for anything related to the conference. You all know, right, I don't man. know if you all have the, the power situation figured out already, but I have a 3,000-watt inverter and 100-amp-hour battery that I use okay. for my setup here because occasionally we lose power, like... <laughs> At least on one or two occasions that I've dropped out here on the stream um, has been power loss, uh, which, you know. Yeah, we, we don't have the power thing figured out yet. I've been very busy with other stuff now that MoneroCon's over, poor, uh, like I'm, I'm going to focus in on the conference. But yeah, we, we don't have a solution there yet. Like I was saying before, I'm thinking of getting a Starlink. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? I was thinking of getting a Starlink and a generator, essentially. Yeah, maybe a generator would be fine. Um, I could hypothetically... Uh, bring my inverter and battery over and it would be like a zero cost okay and how would that how would that play into the setup with uh with like a generator you're saying that'd be more re a more smoother way if battery if power goes down to have a battery so, backup yeah exactly so um i basically just plug this thing into my wall it, it's like a backups you know the the you know uninterruptible power supply but those mm -hmm. things are garbage because they use lead acid batteries and they die quickly so I have a lithium, like a life po four battery. Um, oh, sweet. Yeah, and it's a three thousand watt inverter. So with my current battery, I could run, I could run like twelve hundred watts continuously for, I believe, uh, one hour. So I don't know. If so you think be... we'd be? Yeah, that would like keep the the speakers up and running and stuff. You think? Um, we'd have to do Maybe like a anchor. quick some napkin math on how big the speakers are and what the total power load on the system is. Um, okay. I suspect it's probably maybe like 1500 Watts. Um, so I can't remember how long the power would go down for, but as long as the power is only out for like 10 minutes, it should be more than capable. Oh yeah. It if definitely not, went out for, I, I want to say maybe like an hour or so. It definitely went out for a little while. Yeah. The other thing too, is that was the rainy season, right? That was during the well, rainy no, season. The, so. the, big, the biggest issue was they were intentionally switching the power because they have their own generator. And I think they were like stealing power from the from the grid. I don't know what they were doing over there, but they were switching it. They were switching it from one thing to the other, and it was they probably didn't have a switch. fully active system. Yeah, so it got so cut like, off in the meantime I, while they were switching. I think we need our own generator, and it's just running off our own generator the entire time. Like it's not on theirs, and then we have our thing as backup. I think we just need to run it off our own generator the entire time. Um, yeah, that would be the more secure solution. For yeah, me. so I'm looking into that that option. I don't think it's going to be that that expensive. I mean, you know, just some just some some gas to power a generator, a uh, decent sized generator that we rent, and yeah, and then the internet. So okay, all right. Enough about uh, electricity nerd stuff. Let's get into <laughs> price nerd stuff. Yeah, so uh, we're looking here at the Monero chart, and we had talked about last week, in fact, we've been talking about for a couple weeks, um, that this nice big positive movement that we've, oh, you know, we didn't roll the credits, I don't know if that matters or not, but. Oh, I, yeah, Tux, Tux, roll the credits, yeah, we gotta do it. Already, already it's, did, it's, it's, already did. Oh, you did. Okay. Did we? Oh, okay. Hmm. I guess, sorry, I wasn't uh, paying enough attention. Um, okay, anyway, so, yeah, we've got, uh, we had our nice big um, sort of recovery from from the bottom here, from our uh, from all the fuckery they've 
they've managed to pull. Um, and then we came up to this area here and we said for a couple of weeks now that this was really an, an area to expect some resistance to happen. And that's basically what we've seen um, so far, really still holding up pretty well and holding up quite well relative to Bitcoin and even relative to Ethereum. So right now, this is the Bitcoin XMR Bitcoin chart and effectively price, the, the ratio came up to these very long term lower standard deviations. Um, these are, I believe, some of the longest lower standard deviations. Oh no, I lost my uh, I lost my trusty brush. Where did this thing go? Ah, here we go. Uh, yeah, so these guys right here. Um, I know sometimes it can be hard to see them, uh, but those are very long-term lower standard deviations. That's the the lowest cluster I think that uh, that we have currently. Um, so right now we're kind of sitting at that area. Typically, from a wave magic perspective, perspective, this would act as resistance. So perhaps we might see some resistance there. Bitcoin has been taking a little bit of a pause in terms of its uh, its momentum towards the upside. We'll, we'll get to there in a second. It's possible that Bitcoin might see some kind of rebound and that could negatively affect the ratio, obviously. As far as the XMR Ethereum ratio, we haven't quite made it to the lower standard deviations right here. I really was kind of hoping to see us make it all the way there. I, I think that we should. Um, it does look to me, and we've talked about this for the past few weeks now, it does look to me like Ethereum is going to have relatively bullish action, action going into the future. We, we haven't seen too much. Uh, th this chart has actually become very uninteresting, the XMR divergences um, for between Poloniex, Bitfinex, Qcoin, Mexi, relative to Kraken, right? All of these coins, are we're looking at their price relative to Kraken. Um, but the only, I would say the only interesting chart, interesting thing that pops out to me on this chart, um, is that Poloniex is no longer being heavily, uh, heavily towards the downside. So, um, yeah, we, we've talked about that a little bit before. Nothing interesting there. The XMR dominance has also come back as well. Obviously, if you're, if you have made a rebound relative to Bitcoin and relative to Ethereum, well, then the XMR dominance overall is, uh, is, is clearly going to show some kind of rebound. So right now, we would be coming up on this sort of horizontal area of significance, but basically we're just defining this area right there. Um, and we're effectively coming up to that horizontal line. That would also probably potentially spell some resistance. Although, how many people are actually looking <laughs> at the, uh, the XMR dominance chart and trading off of it? I have to imagine it's probably not that many. So in terms of like sociology and you know chart analysis, the, this chart wouldn't necessarily have as much impact from a technical analysis standpoint um, because of, you know, simply because a lot of times TA works because other people are using TA. Um, so, but at, at any rate, this would still be an interesting place to, to look at, right? To, to expect maybe some small amount of resistance. Um, but yeah, Monero has just kind of been uh, chopping sideways for the past week. So nothing really super duper interesting. In terms of the broader crypto market, the, the big story that happened here is Mt. Gox said that they're going to begin repayments um, in July. So we're, we're really looking here within the next few weeks. We should be expecting to see people get repaid their Bitcoin and their Bitcoin cash. And that's been it's been 10 years, guys. So these guys are finally, finally getting their their money back. Um, interesting that uh, they're actually doing it at the top of the market. Um, we'll take a look at how the Bitcoin price was affected by this, but obviously <laughs> it dropped on June 24th when this when this letter came out. Um, if you go to the Mt. Gox rehabilitation on Reddit, they actually put a poll up. What do you plan to do with your coin? And so it looks like um, quite a decent number of people plan to hodl. But if you look at it, um, it looks like. Wow, 38, 38 people keep up. this. This has got to be so. This is not a scientific. Um, this is not a scientific poll here. Obviously, thirty eight people out of uh, looks like two hundred eighty nine total. And I snatched this this morning just before the show. Uh, thirty eight people say they're going to keep all their coins on the exchange, which is kind of hilarious if you think about it. Um, so yeah, some people are going to sell completely, dump everything. Some people are going to sell, you know, fifty percent or less. Um, I wish it seems like it would have made sense sell for altcoins, right? Um, but this all they had was like transfer and hodl. So just in a broader context, let's, let's think about after 10 years of forced hodl, how are people going to react? What's going to be the, the real like expectation here? Well, 10 years is a long time and, and life comes at you. Some people are going to be struggling financially and some people are going to need to sell, right? They're going to need that money for something. Um, not necessarily everyone has been continuing to purchase crypto and not everyone, not everyone is sitting on fat stacks of, of crypto cash. So 
there are going to be some people that have to sell. That's just a reality of life. Um, moreover, there are going to be some people that have moved into the altcoin arena, right? That are not that are no longer interested in Bitcoin. It does look like the maximalist mindset has been waning for a long time. So there's probably a lot of people that are interested in, in getting into some other altcoin. Um, obviously, there's going to be people that want to dump their BCH for Bitcoin and vice versa. There's going to be people that want to dump their Bitcoin for Monero. So I think this could possibly be Monero positive, um, especially in a kind of situation where liquidity is probably lower than it was before the delistings. Um, so there's there's a reasonably good chance that this could affect our price in a, in a significantly positive way. Obviously, there's going to be people that hodl, right? There's going to be your, your maximalists that are hodling their Bitcoin that are never going to sell. A friend of mine once told me, he said that everybody eventually, not everyone, not everybody has to buy, but everybody eventually has to sell. So that's true even under like hyper Bitcoinization. Even in that case, if you're old and you don't want to work, you know, you're 80 years old, you got your stash, whatever, your hodl that you, that you picked up 50 years ago, well, you're still going to have to pay expenses for, for life. And under even under a hypothetical hyper Bitcoinization or hyper Monerization or whatever, um, you're, you're going to have the scenario where eventually the volatility drops off, the, the liquidity is massive, and everyone's just using this thing for real trade, in which case you're not going to be getting mad gains anymore from your hodl. Um, and this is going to become more and more true the higher and higher any market cap for any crypto goes. So eventually everyone does have to sell. Um, maybe not, maybe like you've got, uh, you know, some kind of like yield assets, right? Cause you, you're not only just dumbly hodling, but at any rate, um, yeah, that's kind of what we can expect from the, from the Mt. Gox, uh, coins. They're going to finally be released. You can see here, Bitcoin has been dropping off throughout, throughout the past week, really throughout the past, um, two weeks. How many candles is that? 22. So for the past like three weeks, Bitcoin has been dropping off, but this big red candle, if you look down here at the bottom, you can see that uh, that that's uh, July 24th is when that happened, which was the same date that uh, that they released this. So, yeah, I mean, that's completely expected, right? <laughs> Finally, Mt. Gox is releasing the coin. So you're going to see the speculators, the speculators um, dumped the price of Bitcoin. So that's mm, that's not really like too huge of a deal for price because things still are, are effectively going to the weekly now. Uh, things are still effectively following this pleb line towards the upside. Um, so. Uh, this this is an interesting pleb line. I normally normally you don't cut through uh, you don't cut through so many candle bodies, but it this just this just felt like a better way to draw the the, the trend of what's happened because we had for a while you know we had um, <clears throat> okay there's the very bottom like the absolute bottom of the market then you kind of connect these points price broke down came back up and then it sort of rode the line here so this really is like seems like the best place to draw the line and it's kind of interesting that currently this line seems to be holding up. I wouldn't necessarily expect this line to to like magically hold support here, especially considering that we have actually broken down this line in the past. I believe that was, um, yeah, that was kind of like that was that was the scare where we said, hey, things might be looking like they're going to drop, and then and then everything just rebounded to the upside. Um, again, macro liquidity still being highly present, the ETF um, becoming more and more likely. Um, this was kind of a I wouldn't call it a false breakdown, but you know this was a little bit of fear. In the markets. So right now, the point of that is to say that this line is not like some sort of hard magical support. Um, we could actually Bitcoin could break down below this line for a period of time. Uh, it would not surprise me at all. At the same time, it, it doesn't have to, right? It doesn't have to. Things are things are kind of washing out. Things have consolidated from trying to get to that all time high. Um, maybe after these Gox coins get flushed out and people have the opportunity to sell, perhaps. Um, that could that could sort of erase some of the negative sentiment that might be floating out there, erase some of the fear. And if markets still continue positive, and if the Ethereum ETF gets approved, um, that should be also bullish for Bitcoin, right? It's just broadly bullish in general. It says, "Hey, crypto is here. It's here to stay. The attacks are largely, you know, for the most part, they're going away, and 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 it's time for for the the broader society to accept the inevitability of cryptocurrency." So. Um, <coughs> And, and in fact, let's actually take a look here at, um, oh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you guys the other one later. Um, yeah, there was another story with the federal reserve and 33 terabytes of data. We'll, we'll focus on crypto here for now. Um, so yeah, in my mind, it's, it's big, it's, it's Ethereum versus Bitcoin. Ethereum is, is, has broken some resistances. We have the ETF is going to be approved. Gary Gensler said before the end of the summer, the ETF will be live. Now the Mt. Cox, uh, the Mt. Gox coins are getting dropped on the market. So Ethereum is going to be the beneficiary of this. 
it, it's obviously a lot of that a lot of that institutional cash that went into the Bitcoin ETF. Some of that's going to flow to Ethereum once it gets approved. Uh, again, these ETFs are spot ETFs, which means that real crypto, real Bitcoin, real Ethereum has to get purchased when normie boomers on the stock market are buying the ETF or traditional finance on the stock market is buying the ETF. That represents real cash flowing into the crypto market, which is why the Bitcoin ETF has been so broadly positive for, for a decent amount of time. Um, the same thing is likely to happen here with the Ethereum ETF. And let's take a look at the uh, at the weekly, um, so just so you can get your bearings on this chart. Um, we have this structure that we call a descending wedge. Um, you can see that, yeah, these lines are actually pretty clearly drawn. Um, this chart pattern has been very long in the tooth. This The top line here has been developing for two years. The bottom line uh, has been developing for three years now. So this is a very pretty, pretty solid um, descending wedge. And at the moment, this thing looks like it is breaking towards the upside. So the breakout is not like totally, totally confirmed. But if we take a look at um, the way that this upper line is formed, you can see that this is kind of your best fit line to try and fit most of these peaks. You don't like right here. Um, you got a couple wicks above it. You got a little space right there touching um, a slight wick above there. But right now, this is kind of how the S&P 500 broke back in January 2023. We were looking at this and saying, hey, the S&P 500 is starting to look pretty bullish because what happens? You, you're kind of on this downtrend. You come to the top of the line, you stop here, didn't even make the splitter, right? Didn't even make this splitter right here and then came back to the upside and now it's breaking. We are now Ethereum versus Bitcoin. I say we, but I mean, you know, I'm a DJ. I'm not going to lie. I, I gamble, you know, I, I participate. So right now what we have here is a break, a little bit of consolidation at the line and then another day above it and another close above it. So we're pulling back today, um, but still this is bullish, right? This chart has been, is basically flirting with, 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 a full confirmed break of that resistance, that capping resistance line. So the other thing that we're also looking at in terms of the wave magic on, on a bit shorter time frame here is the upper standard deviations you can see in blue, right? That's That's been kind of an obvious place where price has been a little bit stopped out, but you can also see the more longer term, lower standard deviations. So the orange bands, so the very top of the orange band is a very common action I see in, in wave magic where price is trying to get out of that price is trying to break out of these lower bands and it has its resistance here. So there is like this zone here is a pretty significant zone of resistance, but breaking out of that, um, which I think could very possibly happen next week. I think there's a reasonably good chance this could happen next week, but if not next week, um, when the bot, when the Gox coins start to hit the market, probably this thing's going to break out. Um, what you want to see effectively is a break of that, of those blue bands, maybe some consolidation and then starting to move to the upside. If you're a swing trader, right, or if you're a momentum trader, that would be your your long point, right? You've convincingly broken the downtrend. You've convincingly got convincingly gotten out of the statistical levels, um, and then uh, you know you've consolidated there, and then things are moving up. I mean, from from there, you would really expect to get to the longer uh, the longer term blue bands. The blue bands being upper standard deviation. So you would expect price to make it um, effectively into this area. So sorry to to spend so long on ETH guys and, and continuing to hammer it, but I want to get you. I just want to deliver to you guys what the price is most likely to do. And right now, the price in terms of crypto, uh, Ethereum, Ethereum is likely to outperform Bitcoin for a decent amount of time. So if you guys are gamblers, and I know some, of, <laughs> I know some of you are, um, Ethereum is going to be your better bet here versus Bitcoin. So if you made those nice Bitcoin gains, hell, even if you're maximalish. Like bros, maxi bros, just do yourself a favor and like don't 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 be so religious that you keep yourself from the gains. So um, the other thing too is we, we can see this in the Bitcoin dominance, same, same kind of story, uh, except in reverse. Uh, we're looking at breaking down this long term trend line. I've been saying for for really um, a month or so that this chart does look like it's kind of rolling over. The the momentum loss was pretty clear here. Um, oh, you know, effectively starting like right around this area. And now th things haven't like fully broken down, right? Like we've, we've seen a little bit of breakdown here before on, on this chart back in, uh, I guess that was early this year, but that was also in Jan like when this thing broke down, that was in January this year where Bitcoin is about to get the release on the ETF, right. And, and get a lot of positivity. So right now things are breaking down sort of on the opposite side there where Ethereum is about to get the ETF and Bitcoin Gox coins are about to be dropped onto the market. And that's like 140,000 um, Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash. Oh, we probably have Bitcoin cash bros listening on the stream too. Just, um, just beware guys. Like you had really good performance early this year. I would say, take some of that profit. Like you're about to get a lot of maxis with their hands on some BCH. And what do you think they're going to do with those coins? <laughs> right? Like it's pretty obvious what, what those maxis are going to do with those coins. So 
um, you could have some price problems um, uh, coming up for you. So I say, you know, take a little bit of profits, maybe rotate it into some other. Uh, the other thing, too, is that with the Ethereum ETF um, and with the Gox coins, we're looking at, generally speaking, we are probably looking at some kind of alt season um, on the horizon. So there could be some opportunity for some like particularly poignant degeneracy. So just prepare your minds for that. Um, <laughs> speak of the devil, this guy right here, TRX in green in dark green. Um, TRX has been performing. Okay. All right. Good for, uh, good for Tron. Good for Justin Sun. Good for Tether. Um, they've got a nice big pump here. So yeah, just expect, um, where we could be going into a degeneracy season that of course will always be predicated on what is the macro doing? If the macro is crap, um, and we're looking at higher tail risk there, there could be the potential that maybe those gains get muted. Um, although I kind of, I, I have a little bit of a theory here where, if we get tail risk, the higher the tail, like, so right now we're, we'll just call it medium tail risk. But if tail risk starts to rise in these markets, what we're probably going to see is the markets themselves actually going up. That's what happened pre-COVID. And we'll, we'll look at that a little bit more closely with some charts. But effectively, as the tail risk was rising going into 2020, um, the market pumped pretty significantly. And then the dump happened, you know, in March when all the bad things that shall not be mentioned uh, came to pass. Um, the markets dropped, they crashed, but they crashed after pumping like 10 or 15, 20%, which is for the S&P, that's huge. Okay, so looking at the macro with a mind to the macro, let's take a look at the reverse repos because finally something interesting happened after like, <laughs> I don't know, two or three months of nothing interesting happening. So reverse repos being money that gets parked with the Federal Reserve overnight and they get the federal funds rate minus some tiny, tiny percentage. Um, so effectively, it's like risk-free yield that's highly liquid. Um, so that money has been dropping, dropping, dropping for a long time. And it was the drop in the reverse repos, money coming out of the Federal Reserve, going into assets, risk assets, that I think has significantly helped to drive the bullish situation that we've seen now for, um, I guess that would be a year and a half at this point. So interestingly enough, the Federal, the the reverse repos um, spiked up, right? We got a pretty big spike here from, looks like 400 billion, below 400 billion, uh, 300 and, eh, 340 billion. Now sitting at 650 billion, right? So we're looking at over 300 billion dollars um, went into the Federal Reserve re reverse repos. That's that's that raises an eyebrow, guys. Like that's that's pretty big. Um, the markets have kind of slightly, I wouldn't say rolled over, but they you know they're they are experiencing a little bit of resistance right now. The S and P 500, the, the Nasdaq. Um, but yeah, this kind of spike is we see it from time to time. But if this thing is sustained and continues to move to, towards the upside. Um, that will be, we're going to call that rising tail risk, right? And maybe not even necessarily rising tail risk. It could just mean rising risk in general, like rising, uh, rising risk for being in the stock market, for being in crypto, right? Because stocks and crypto are the volatile, risky assets, right? That you, that you want to put your money into to get the gains, but sometimes, you know, they're going to drop more than others. So we got to keep an eye on this. This happened, um, this happened last, uh, sorry, this happened this week, starting like Eh, pretty much as soon as the week kicked off, as soon as Monday kicked off, things started moving towards the upside there on the reverse repos. So, um, yeah, that does raise an eyebrow. We need to keep an eye on that. Um, it doesn't, that doesn't signal necessarily gains to come. Um, so the Dixie dollar index is still just taking its sweet time. I, this chart still looks broadly positive to me in, in a very large context. What we have here is, um, is the, the, the moving standard deviations are still rising, right? You can see that the Dixie have effectively found support generally speaking in that large, large upper standard deviation area, which is still sloping towards the upside, which kind of indicates uh, a, a little bit of positivity there. So the the Dixie is is now consolidating it at this level. It has been for a while. It's taking its sweet time. I still think this is the level to look for. Realistically, uh, if we're going to get any kind of big mar market pullback, if we get any kind of tail risk, doesn't happen to ha doesn't have to happen now, doesn't have to happen this year, could be next year. Um, but ultimately, this wouldn't be a, too crazy of a place to look for. So Dixie around 110, 100, 111. I think that could happen. I, I think that could reasonably happen. Uh, maybe not sooner, but perhaps um, later on. So currently, Dixie still mildly bullish, but really taking its sweet time. Um, gold, gold actually hanging on here. So we might even be able to try and draw some sort of like different um, lines here on this chart and say, all right, this is this looks more like that. Maybe we maybe we'll try and draw this line a little bit more shallow, right? We could we could probably try and say something like that. It's a sideways triangle. It's a pennant. Maybe I don't know. You could also try and say the the head and shoulders thesis uh, as we talked about, saying you know maybe 
Maybe this is a head and shoulder situation. The target for that would be somewhere down here. Uh, you know, may, maybe. Um, the markets really have gone up a lot. And while gold has has come to the upside, I'm not convinced that it's that it's done, um, that it's done with its like larger uh, macro move here. But at some point, um, it will be time to rotate out of gold and into risk assets. But that'll probably happen after some kind of like um, either tail risk event or the threat of a tail risk event that sees the intervention. So, um, yeah, OK, whatever there. Da, da, da. Let's look at um, speaking of tail risk just really quickly. This is the bond market. Um, the inversion here is in red. We are not seeing any massive volatility here in terms of the rates, right? We're looking for this to drop off to the downside. That will signal tail risk. The yield curve inversion to come back to the upside sharply. That's like, that's poignant, sharp tail risk kind of things that we would be looking at there. But nothing to see here today. Again, um, you know, everything just kind of continuing, continuing to chug along as normal. The S&P 500 looks to be, um, as we talked about, you know, this very like this is sort of the the, the most local but longest term um, sort of rising resistance at this point, which which the S&P kind of hit. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's no reason that it that it can't uh, maybe consolidate and then kind of come for you know, trying to shoot to the rest to the top side of that line and try and ride its ride to the upside, um, ride to victory towards the upside. Uh, the uh, the Nasdaq, this chart is a lot dirtier than the S&P. I don't like that. There's not like really solid lines here. Um, the, the best one that we could draw would be this guy right there. Um, that line is not entirely relevant at the moment. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, in, in this case, we would be looking at these lines less as a definition and more as reference. Um, they're not like the, 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 the NASDAQ lines are not being like defining for us what the market is, is going to be doing. It's not prescriptive, right? It's more just referential. Um, we could take a quick look here at the, uh, the wave magic on these as well. Okay. You know, the stocks, boring boomer or whatever. Um, okay. But yeah, we're, we're basically in these purple lines, which is something we have long expected to make. And, uh, ultimately if the S and P is going to continue rising, probably the quote unquote mad gains, which, you know, for the S and P 500 mad gains constitute 31%. That, that is actually pretty good. Wow. 31% is actually pretty good. Um, yeah. So the S and P at this point is probably not going to be crazy popping past these purple lines. I wouldn't expect that. So probably most of the the crazy big rebound reaction recovery that has happened over the past year and a half, probably most of that is behind us now. Um, if it's going to continue going up, this is probably slow and steady kind of gains here for the S&P. The NASDAQ, I think, still has a little bit of catching up to do in terms of in terms of its own chart. Right. The NASDAQ and like the NASDAQ versus the S&P, which would be this chart. Um, is actually doing great. Like it's it's at all time highs. This is a bullish chart. You, you've got the wave magic upper standard deviations already curling towards the upside. Um, but in terms of its own performance relative to its own um, past history, the NASDAQ here, you would still kind of expect it to eventually make those purple bands, right? So the NASDAQ would need a little bit more upside here. So to, to quite make those purple bands. Now, maybe it doesn't, I, I it just, that's what it tends to do over long periods of time. The NASDAQ and the S&P just tend to ride these purple bands towards the upside. So, um, yeah, this chart still looks pretty good. I'm not saying that it that it can't pull back tomorrow. It might. I don't have any strong opinions on what the S&P and, and the NASDAQ do exactly immediately. But um, overall, the tail risk is still low. Um, the macro is still largely on, except for this problem with the uh, with the reverse repos. But the reality is that insiders can move their money. We could see the reverse repos go to the upside for a while before any like effects happen on the stock market. We could see the Dixie rise significantly. And that's what happened actually before the, the bear market really kicked off um, in, in 2022. We had already seen the, the, the dollar index rise significantly going into 2022 um, before the, the bear market really kicked off. So, um, yeah, we can we can see like if these trends continue and set themselves up to continue bullish, then we're going to have to get bearish. Right. And, and we'll 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 do that hopefully at the appropriate time. At the moment, this is just the very beginning. Right. This is just eyebrow raising. This is not um, this is not an indictment against uh, against the current bull market. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, but overall, yeah, I mean, I, I really I would like to tell you guys that Monero is going to take off here to the upside. I think that there's a reasonably good case from the fundamentals that because of the Gox coin, some people are going to move that into Monero. I think there is a reasonably good case that we could see Monero take uh, make it up here to this area over the coming, let's just say, uh, two to six weeks. I think that that could make some oh, sense. Wow. Maybe two to eight weeks. Right. Uh, but, yeah, I think the fundamentals are there. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. So I not financial advice, mm -hmm. um, financial <laughs> advice. Come at me, bro. 
No, please don't. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll take it then. <laughs> when is the whole Mount Gox thing happening now? Then um, they the said they issue. were going to re uh, begin repayments in July. So mm. that was June twenty fourth. They, they said that, and then here the repayments will be made from the beginning of July twenty twenty four. So wow, 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 wow. Yeah, I do. Yep. I do think that will create some buying pressure for Monero. You get yeah. this, some some percentage of that. Yeah, for sure. Very cool, man. Fantastic as always. Thank you, body. Thank you.